Larian Studios, a Belgian independent game developer that in more recent years have made themselves a household name in the RPG space, with their critically acclaimed games Divinity Original Sin 2 as well as of course Baldur's Gate 3. RPG epics taking players on incredible journeys, role-playing as fantastical player-created characters such as SoundCloud rapper Lord Farquaad and Party Time Grinch. But Larian's award-winning RPG experiences actually began in 2002, with the first entry into their Divinity series, releasing top-down real-time action RPG Divine Divinity. Over the next 15 years, Larian would release seven Divinity titles in various ARPG styles, with the most recent entry being the turn-based ARPG Divinity Original Sin 2, and in the late 2000s, taking on the third-person perspective with the dragon-wielding adventure Divinity 2 The Dragon Knight Saga. The trade blows with some of the goofiest RBGs of the mid-2000s. A constantly charming yet surprisingly brutal adventure. Jesus Christ. A journey into what would make up the foundations to this studio becoming such a beloved powerhouse today. My name's Mitch Mannix, and this is a look into Divinity 2, the Dragon Knight Saga. And while we're on the subject of Baldur's Gate, have you ever wondered what the love child of the classic Baldur's Gate and Heroes of Might of Magic 3 would look like if it were made today? Well luckily you don't have to wonder anymore, thanks to this video's sponsor, Broken Ranks, an MMORPG unlike any other. You can experience firsthand right now. An immersive journey through a captivating narrative filled with a spectrum of emotions. Dive into a world where decisive moments shape the fate of nations, and where personal stories of extraordinary characters unfold. Experience the tale of a refugee seeking belonging, a hero striving to reclaim what was lost to invaders, and a struggle to unite a fractured nation. Your choices will determine the course of Tanyan history. The innovative combat system combines the best of turn-based and action games. Plan your moves within 10 seconds and strategize alongside a diverse set of classes, each with their own unique abilities. Immerse yourself in a world that rewards bravery and punishes weakness. Download Broken Ranks for free using the link in the description to begin your quest to shape the destiny of a nation. And a massive thank you to Broken Ranks for sponsoring this video. And now, let's get to it. Beginning the game, we are treated to a pretty impressive looking opening cutscene, showcasing some of the game's characters, including an epic looking armor clad gent that sadly looks like a recent gust of wind may have just rid him of his prized toupee, as well as one of the land's dragon hunters chasing down their latest flying fiend. Following this, we are dropped into the game's character creation, which is pretty light on options, but enough for choosing from male or female and a number of alternative looks for your chosen hero. With our journey, it's decided being that of Ted Diablo, a distant forefather of who would eventually be the devilishly stylish L'Oreal Diablo, years later in Larian's latest title, for me at least. Beginning our journey and getting informed of our mission, to complete the trials to become a fully-fledged dragon slayer, beginning by finding out that what Ted lacks in incredible hair, he more than makes up for with his incredibly large arse, truly throwing it back as we make our way to the game's first settlement, encountering Edmund, who confirms our task of meeting up with the town's archmage, to begin our trial to earn the title of Dragon Slayer, and an example of the game's fully voiced interactions that expand out through the entire game which for the time and even now was great to see and just adds to the game's immersion, as well as providing some funny moments as we'll see later on. After getting a look around town and booting around some chickens with our arms out in front of us, like some kind of escaped mental patient, we find the Archmage Morgana, who after a conversation transforms us into one of the glowing eyeball sporting dragon slayers, which is not the only perk we receive in this starting village, as while wandering back into town, we are stopped by another of the slayers and given the ability to read minds at the cost of some experience, an interesting mechanic that is actually used heavily in both the base game and its expansion to reveal secrets and get an edge in negotiations. But for me at least, the mind I would like to read the most would be that of the developers responsible for the game's animations, with some being a little questionable to say the least. I must say the brutishness of steel <laughs> suits you better than the subtlety of magic. <laughs> uh, okay. Finishing off our time in the starter village of Farglow, we are tasked with picking one of three starting classes, out of warrior, archer, and mage, with a chance to test out each class and some goblins nearby. You know, when that's the first combat animation you see, the things are about to get wild. 
The decision is made to go with the mage class, with the choice being like for example in most FromSoft games, serving more as an opening template for stats over a fully committed choice. Making our way back to our party, our lady friend explains that a dragon has been sighted nearby, and we are to give chase and investigate as our first mission as a dragon hunter, getting whisked away in quite a cool looking dragon slayer airship, and getting treated to another great looking cutscene, taking us to the first of the game's main zones, Broken Valley. It's in Broken Valley that we get a chance to truly explore and get a look at what really makes up this RPG's core experience, making our way down to the first village in the zone and meeting its inhabitants to inquire about the dragon, as well as to pick up a number of side quests to get started. Inhabitants such as vendors, that along with making some odd noises, about night. stands proudly behind his stock of potions strewn out on display, while actually selling a grand total of zero potions in his shop. The town's guard that spend their time getting totally shit-faced in the town's tavern, leading to them running around confused photobombing conversations while wielding their pints around like greatswords, along with a whole host of other characters to meet and collect quests for, along with of course more people to try out our new skill of mind reading for some extra hilarity. I'd like to think that I'm as tolerant as the next man, but if this idiot asks me to like and subscribe on the video, I'm gonna slam my face into a beehive. With a collection of side quests in hand and after getting a chance to explore the land a bit, it has to be said that for a game from 2009, Divinity 2 does have some really nice looking environments for the time, both in its large open areas as well as its darker caves and dungeons, with a great use of lighting. Divinity 2 also features a good amount of variety in its main and side quests to get stuck into, turning away from the legions of kill 5 of these or collect 10 of those, instead the quests having much more nuance to them, such as breaking out a bandit to gain his trust and to then go undercover in his bandit camp, or ridding a church of its haunted ghost infestation. It's interesting to see that the questing used in large to flush out the world and its characters being something that Larian has championed well for a long time, and not just in the studio's more recent releases. I was taking a stroll when a man popped up out of nowhere and soul forged me with a chicken! <laughs> well I hope it wasn't one of those. Finishing up some initial tasks, we get a look at another interesting design choice by way of having a number of options of rewards when completing quests. Items, bonus XP, cash and materials are on offer, I suppose to allow for players to focus in on areas that they would like to receive upgrades for while progressing through the game. And it's while progressing that we encounter a wounded soldier by some ruins, a soldier that it's revealed is a dragon knight, an infamous kind, that can transform into a dragon at will, a soldier that in her dying breath throws us into a dream sequence and shows us a turn of events that's a little bit confusingly cobbled together, ultimately indicating that we have been granted her dragon knight powers, giving a small sample of a yet to be unlocked dragon abilities, as well as revealing the main antagonist of the game, the upset toupee enjoyer from the game's opening cutscene, named Damien, and upon waking we are introduced to Xandalor, the most typically designed wizard character ever conceived, who talks us through our quest to track down and stop Damien, setting up the game's core plotline. With the stage now set, Divinity 2 takes the gloves off in more than one capacity going forward. I could use what? a <laughs> Oh my god, teleporting bastards. With the game's world opening up, and most profoundly in the game's challenges, with the difficulty becoming as volatile as me with my video thumbnail choices, shifting swiftly from casual fleeting face-off to an impossible death trap in what feels like seconds. A particularly potent force when coupled with the game's incredible art of sucker punching the player throughout the game's runtime. <laughs> I lost count of the amount of times that I would finish up a conversation just to get absolutely obliterated before even getting a second to figure out what was happening. So be it. Which as the game progresses builds up to increasingly comical levels of instant death ridiculousness. To fight back while working through the game, the player is granted a wide array of skills, spells and passive abilities to spec into to grow in power to go along with collecting the game's impressively abundant and satisfyingly intricate gear. Every skill is available to begin leveling up from the beginning, and although looking like a lot from the skill screen, when accounting for passive skills doesn't exactly leave a huge amount of activated skills on the table to choose from, especially when compared to titles such as the Two Worlds sequel released only a year later, with a magic system so in-depth that you could cook up an umbrella of baboons if so desired. Check out my recent video for more on that one. Divinity 2's magic and skills really boil down mostly to tried and true RPG magic mainstays, such as melee attack whirlwinds, fireballs, and summoning, with the summoning actually being a bit more built out, having the ability to summon a range of demons for damage and ghosts to heal, with the latter being especially effective given the game's difficulty. 
leading to me spending a huge amount of time getting absolutely wrecked, then having to just stand here next to fucking nightmare fuel Saicho Bob, waiting for him to heal me up. Each ability can be leveled all the way up to 15, with resetting of skill abilities being unlocked about a third of the way through the base game, but still with no way to reset stat points, which was a confusing choice. Skill resets are done at the player's Battle Tower, a pretty cool base of operations, with a number of floors dedicated to services for the player, such as an alchemy floor for making potions, a workshop for enchanting items, and a necromancy pool centered around the summons ran by a necromancer that made me laugh way too much. Yes! <laughs> One eternity later. It's like the most stupidly typical thing ever. Death! <laughs> the Battle Tower even features a number of NPCs that the player can gear up and send out on missions collecting resources to allow for passive gathering when out completing quests. The necromancy ring in particular was a highlight, with that mental necromancer allowing players to build their own summonable monster that is put together using swappable components that each gives different stats and even assigns a class leading to stronger and alternative classes of summonable creatures, which was fun to experiment with, along with great for combating enemy summoned undead, that on occasion were a little less than predictable to say the least. Ah, you will feel my wrath when I find you. Ah, I've got sun cream in my eyes. Ah, but whenever you need to sneeze, you're fucked. Not long after unlocking the Battle Tower, advancing further we were able to fully unlock our dragon powers, getting access to arguably this game's most interesting feature, being able to transform and take to the skies to explore the land and take out enemy forces, with a completely separate set of skills to upgrade and unlock, a feature that aside from the final moments is completely removed from the game's expansion for some reason. Not just that, but the ability to fly around, fight from the skies and quickly traverse the land was only really used in one of the base game's acts too which is a real shame as felt like it could have much more of a presence in the game, especially giving its importance to the narrative, as well as of course its inclusion giving the game a unique spin on the whole adventure, which even during its very light usage, still giving way to some memorable moments, such as taking on the game's flying fortresses in the third act, a challenge that was simultaneously both excruciating and exhilarating at the same time, the absolutely crazy mob density and tough as nails enemies, carefully considering spells and abilities while swapping from human to dragon form to take out enemy ballistrian structures was great, but all felt like it was over in the blink of an eye, relegating me back to wandering around caves on foot and tasks such as trying to figure out the origin of a dungeon filled with chickens. Uh, okay. This however isn't to say that the more traditional RPG questing experience in Divinity 2 doesn't have its strengths. For example, it was interesting to see such attention put on the creation of some of the game's quests, considering where the developers would reach in later years, with really memorable experiences such as tracking down a killer that has carved up an entire brothel using the clues left behind, or being stalked by a reanimated female warrior with a speech impediment, whose dialogue includes what surely must be an intentional amount of troublesome lines. So, you met my spectre sister, squire, but Sasson shan't be resurrected. Setting up trials for two alternative skill trainers to face off against each other for a place in the player's battle tower, or choosing to side with the bandits or the land citizens while working through side quests in a bandit camp. The game's quests and characters were really the driving force for me when working through the game and its expansion, helped greatly by the talented voice casting of the land's inhabitants, even if some of the characters lean quite eye-rollingly close to stereotypes. I'm rather busy drinking, so let's make this quick if you don't mind. Overall, the experience in Divinity 2, as with so many of the 2000s RPGs, has some seriously rough edges, even for the time, with for example its insane spikes in difficulty, as well as its quite awkward feeling combat, challenges that feel hard due to confusing design choices over actually being set up to test the player. The game also does have some odd pacing to it, when unlocking features for the player, granting such a cool battle tower with a host of integral upgradable features and interactable characters hours into the game, which even features its own lap dancer for our hero to enjoy. This is probably going to be awkward without music. No, 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 it's, uh, it's awkward anyway.
the game oddly sparingly uses one of its core features and the ability to play as a dragon. But when it's all said and done, I still had a really great time playing through this game, even so many years after release. While a struggle at times to play through, the charm of games such as the later Divinity games as well as Baldur's Gate 3 can be seen here in Divinity 2. One minute getting worked up at the game's inconsistent difficulty, just to find myself neck minute laughing at some mad looking summoner flailing his arms about wildly trying to throw out some evil, and of course some chickens, all done in such an incredibly over the top way. <laughs> finally finishing some quests for the local blacksmith, leading to him giving me lower prices in his store, just to have him then instantly bugger off afterwards. Uh, wait, what? What? Cheeky bastard. Or having issues traversing some lava in some temple grounds, just to lean on the game's strange stamina-less agility. Looked like the lava was about to foil me, but luckily I'm Spider-Man, apparently. It's easy while playing through Divinity 2 to see, that along with the third person perspective this time around, that Larian was still trying things out to see where they wanted to go with their games, trying out a number of styles in their Divinity series, real time top down to third person to the turn based original Sin titles that would lead to their breakthrough into critical acclaim. And I for one are grateful that they even managed to make a stop off to make a third person goofy 2000s RPG to go along with it. And I can't help but applaud such a strategy when refining the craft of game development, as I imagine this willingness to experiment so much to see where their strengths lie is a key component to how Larian Studios have become such a force to be reckoned with within the space, and a company for me at least that I hope leads to a few others taking some serious notes. We'll slash and sew it till like no other it deals death! <laughs> I love this guy. Well, that's enough from me. What do you think? Do you think that deep character-based experiences will flourish once again? Or will live services eventually kill off the whole thing? Either way, I'm keen to get your thoughts down in the comments. Please drop the video a like if you enjoyed it. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel as we've got some crazy cool stuff coming up soon. And I don't want you to miss it, man. I want to give a massive shout out to the channel patrons who help in keeping the content coming. If you're interested in all sorts of perks, including behind the scenes, bloopers, and fully exclusive videos, the link to the channel patron page is down in the description, along with the discord, which is available for everybody. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Shit. Oh, Jesus, calm down. Oh dear Lord, what have I done? Standing upon his steed like a segne, the former being mostly due to his reputation of being slightly less than accurate with his spells for unknown reasons.